What's up? Welcome back to another episode of Animators React. We are joined by the one and only Tom Bancroft here today. We're going to be looking at a bunch of cool stuff. Tom, what are we looking at, though? Well, we're going to go back and we're going to learn about the old school today and how it's affect the new school. I like school. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> <laughs> Another childhood favorite of mine. What is this? Nostalgia Lane? We're going to look at old school Disney stuff and how that now translates into what's happening now in computer animation. You gotta say I love you back. Even this, this isn't super easy to do in 2D. In action sequence, much easier to pull off. They're bringing a lot of what feels like traditional animation techniques into modern animation. It'll be interesting to get this insight from you and where this is coming from, why it's there, how it's been used. And maybe even some places where it doesn't work. All right. Let's well, do this. Let's jump in. So this is the old mill. 1937. That was a few years ago. It, it dates us, doesn't it? I was born <laughs> 1938, just after this. And, but anyway, but really what's groundbreaking in this film is it's the first use of the multiplane camera. I was wondering, I saw that parallax going by, that little leaf that was moving faster than the background. There it is right there. So there's some right there. You've heard about parallax and things like that. Obviously, this is still a term that we use today in film. This yeah. film led to Snow White. Without this film, there would have been no Snow White. Wow, okay. Now, is something like this a multiplane moment as well? It's, it's a good question. So though this wouldn't be considered a multiplane shot, they were so expensive and time consuming to create that they were very sporadic. Like they'd go, okay, you get five multiplane shots. And they tended to be establishing shots where you're like coming into a setting, like right. at the beginning of, a, of the film or something like that. And I've done this before when I went to Cal Arts. <laughs> We had the old platinum that Disney had donated to Cal Arts, and it was from Dumbo, was the rumor that Dumbo was shot on it. There'd be a peg strip down here. You'd put on all your cells, the background first, of course, and then the camera's up there shooting down. And it's just this big glass thing with hinges, and you'd shut it down, and then you put click. <laughs> Did that one friend? Do it all over again. These cameramen would just stay up all night and shoot everything that was finished that day. Oh, that, that'd be so easy to mess up. That'd be so easy movie. to mess up. Oh, it gets messed up, yeah. <laughs> now, usually they catch it in dailies. Mm. By the way, dailies were weeklies. They weren't dailies. <laughs> but in Bambi, there's a shot where a raccoon disappears. They knew when they released Bambi that this was a mistake, but this was such a hard shot because of this camera move and everything. Watch that raccoon. Oh, there it goes. Oh, oh wow. So it's in the movie and it's been in the movie for what, 40, 50 years now? I don't know how long wow. it's, it's been out, but, but how would that happen? The pop thing. And I can tell you why we have pegs, right? And so you can have an A peg, a B peg, and a C peg, so that some characters are on the A peg that are taking place all in that area, because the cells are only so wide. They're not this wide, they're this wide. The cameraman put it on the wrong peg oh. and kept going. And he probably realized it when he did it, and he just kept going, because he's mm. like, I've been shooting this for eight hours. <laughs> I'm not gonna go back and fix that. Walt probably won't even notice. <laughs> but I guarantee they noticed it probably within a week and they went, sorry. <laughs> because literally back in that day, think about enough. it. Uh, and it's kind of fun. You, got, yeah. like, you guys have made a, a job out of it, right? <laughs> Finding those things. So what would you guys do without that? I know, there you go. Filmmakers are lazy sometimes. <laughs> what can you say? Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. Santa here, brought to you by today's sponsor, Bessie. Now I know, you're probably worried because you still have gifts to buy. Bessies make the best holiday gifts. And to prove it, I'm gonna be going around the studio and giving everyone a little Bessie surprise. Ho, ho, ho! I've heard you've been a good boy. You've made some really good videos this year. Bessies are a versatile shoe that you can wear in rain, sleet, or snow. But on top of that, they also come in many different styles and colors to choose from. So you'll be sure to find something for everyone on your nice list. Bessie also offers clothes and accessories that you can wear that are also, of course, waterproof. I'm gonna give you this hat! Uh -huh. <laughs> it's waterproof! Wouldn't you believe it? I wouldn't. Uh <laughs> it's a good boy! Good boy! I feel like a child again. <laughs> Yessie to Vessie. 
Vessies are the perfect shoe for winter because they are, you guessed it, completely waterproof. Oh, well, well, well. Oh, 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 Merry oh, oh. Kixmas! Merry Kixmas! Have you been a good boy? I have. Okay. Yeah. These are some of the best kicks you'll ever have by today's sponsor, Vessi. Get down tonight! Get down tonight! There's these and many other styles. If you just go to vessi.com slash corridor, cool. What's going on? Why are you so suspicious? Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, I'm not suspicious. I'm from the North Pole. Very oh, good boy. Man. They're made from a magical material called Dymatex that keep your feet warm in the winter and cool in the summer. So you can wear them all year round. Oh, great. Bro, I just get one? Another one Inflation. for you. You know, the Dymatex material keeps you very, very warm, but there's something inside that will keep you warmer. What? Been a real good boy, lots of good simulations and sims and nah. Are, no. are we doing oh, this? Oh no! He got cold! Cause he's a bad boy! Well my time here is done, but if you or a loved one have Bessie on your Christmas list, head to Bessie.com slash quarter crew to get 15% off your first whole order. Merry Kixmas! He left some rather unusual footprints. They obviously belong to the same fiend who abducted the girl's father. The Great Mouse Detective. I love this movie. This was like a childhood favorite of mine. I love hearing that. You just dated me. <laughs> I, was, I was in college when this came out, I think. Can you guys oh, see it? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's like three-dimensional perspective changes. Oh, yeah. there it is. There it is. Wait, what is it? Is it actually 3D? Yes. Is this traced over? No. Nope. So it is the first computer animation hybrid, at least at Disney. I, I'm not a historian to that degree. But here's what they did to hide it, is they printed out every single frame onto cells, mm. like a big Xerox machine. The animator would then use the digital printouts that they would peg, and then would animate the character over every single frame and paint it like it was a cell. So they were all hand painted so it would integrate. Normally, like, especially in modern day, you can kind of end up telling when it's a computer generated cartoon because the cell shaded nature of the render, you can usually kind of tell. There's a difference between that and like an actual like hand drawn painting. But here it does look the same. The only thing that kind of gives it away is it's like the perspective shifting of everything is very perfect. good. It's perfect, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you get some of that creep, like that very first shot where Basil wakes up on that gear and you could see his feet are sliding slightly. That was the first time that it had ever been done. And, yeah. that, and they, they were just applauding that animator for like, wait, you did it. It looks like he's <laughs> on that. If you want to jump ahead, there's a, another spot where they did that where now they've gotten really good at it. And that's the ballroom sequence in Beauty and the Beast. Oh, um, wait. Do you remember that when you were young? Like they. It, now it's funny because like it didn't stand out to me as CGI. I, do, I remember seeing the movie and I remember that scene. But now, can't you see it? Like it's they, so obvious. Now here, yeah, isn't it obvious? Like because they rendered it now, they didn't do what they did in Great Mouse Detective, where they printed out the paper and actually put it on cells. This is an actual 3D rendering of that background with hand-drawn characters over it. But what's impressive is how talented this animator had to be to get the perspective. Would there have been any value in trying to oh, actually and, render out like a grid? Yeah, and that, that would have been in the CG that okay. he had. So basically, again, they printed out every frame of the CG animation that was done, low poly, and so he could animate to every single frame, but he still had to draw it right and get yeah. the perspective change. And then while they're moving in circles, but while they're looking at each other and acting, and I can't tell you how hard it is to do, it's masterwork right here. So shout out to James Baxter. This is one of the modern day best animators in the world, one of the top 10 probably. And he wow. animated both Belle and Beast <clears throat> in this three or four shots. The opening shot of uh, Rescuers is is pretty cool. Rescuers Down Under? Rescuers Down Under. Another childhood favorite of mine. <laughs> what is this, Nostalgia Lane? So this is the first film I've ever worked on. This is my first credit in a Whoa. feature film. But now watch this. So they're doing parallax, they're doing multiplane. This shot was like oh, amazing. Wow. Oh yes, I do remember this shot. I do remember this shot. Yeah, okay. I remember the shot. I love your excitement. I do, no, like, this is like, my childhood is literally just flashing before my eyes right now. So now these are CG now though. Okay. This is multiplane, but digital. 
But these are CG flowers, and this is a flat house that we're about to head into. And look how bad that looks. Oh, <laughs> like they couldn't get into the window. They just, we went into black and then they cross dissolved. Like even you know that stick like that goes out of focus, that stick should fly out of camera as we move forwards, but they, they ease out of it. Yeah, you're same. right. Oh, I never thought about yeah. that. Yeah. What? But I it's, didn't it's catch time that. To, it's time that with the title. Catch. But like watch how the title eases in with it. So it gives this feeling that we're like, starting to fly, right? Right. I remember this was like very early in the film and one of the last shots done <laughs> at the same time. I know, I'm coming. Now this is the new generation of animators too. So Beauty and the Beast and Rescuers Down Under are really the two films that was where people like me were coming in and we were starting to mix in with the second generation of animators that were trained by the nine old men, the ones that were there from, from Snow White. Right. This is that transition where it's got some really good animation and then some not so great animation because we were all still learning and stuff. When Glenn Keane comes on, this is what you're talking about, is the eagle sequence. Dude, this kid's just free soloing this cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Dude, Alex Honnold right here. <laughs> You're free. Ah! This is like another level of animation to me. You can see like just the dimensionality and the drawing ability and the consistency right. and just the appeal. Really. The wind. Like, the wind, yeah. The wind. But like Cody just looks cuter and things like that. That's the appeal <laughs> side of it. I know this is good Dude, stuff. Dude, I'm just like right. so distracted by how epic this whole sequence is. <laughs> like is. there's just like moment after moment of just like this is incredible. So this is all Glenn Keane. He's just known to be the best animator in the world. And so he was the supervising animator of Marahute. So most all of these Marahute shots are him doing just what he does, which is just amazing drawing, amazing animation. And that takes years to do. And some of us, I must admit, just never get to that level. And that's the difference between back then, a master 2D animator and the rest of us, <laughs> so, <laughs> to be honest. All right, let's do this one last time. These newer films that have been coming out are starting to bring a lot of these traditional animation elements. I'm curious, you know, with, with your eye, what stands out to you in like what kind of like elements, techniques, lineage, like things you could point out to us that pops yeah. in these films. So with CG animation and why it's taken off, maybe even, well, it has gone further. It killed 2D animation, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but why it's so popular is that obviously you can do so many things with it. And I mean the level of subtlety, all that stuff like what we looked at with Marahute, but with the human character, like the, even this, this isn't super easy to do in 2D. In action sequence, much easier to pull off because what's hard in 2D is all those perspective changes of his face and, oh wait, is that eye now floating and moving around? Because <laughs> yeah. they're not fixed objects, right? Mm -hmm. Eyes can slide, noses can slide. And so in the cleanup side of things, it has to be rock solid and feel like it is. The, but in CG, it is rock solid. It's actually harder to do the opposite where you contort the character. Yeah. They have animators there that are being pushed to go, no, film yourself. And that's really popular, obviously, in CG animation is to to film yourself. By the way, that we couldn't do that in the 90s. We didn't have <laughs> iPhones and all those things. So Let me just rarely... pull out my pocket film camera. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we were like literally using mirrors and like making faces and mirrors. This generation is going, oh wait, we want these characters to be believable. And so therefore we have to look at life, but they're also then throwing an appeal. Where do you think you're going? Hey, don't Okay, now let's talk about the one thing that I don't agree with in Spider-Verse. Oh, okay. I'm gonna get in trouble. Yeah. All right, heck yeah. Um, and it's timing. So you've heard over and over again, we would put things on twos, right? We'd literally tell the computer, take out every other frame. On fast movements, we were trained at Disney to do that always on ones, hmm. meaning every right. drawing you put in for every frame, you don't put it on twos. Twos was used more for when the characters do stop and they just talk to each other and where it's a little bit slower movement. And that was a cost savings thing, but it also ended up looking a little bit more natural in the 2D world. On action scenes, it should all just be on ones, is my opinion. That'll give you that fluidity where your eye can kind of keep up with what's going on. To me, this gets too jerky because they're applying twos or whatever, kind of throughout the whole film, a little bit more blanket than they should. 
there's times like that looked like it was ones where she screams by. And maybe because she's graceful, Gwen, maybe they put her more on ones than on twos, like some of the other characters. Because Peter Parker is on ones, but Miles is on twos. And I thought that was to signify that he's still kind of like an amateur Spider-Man. He doesn't really know how to be smooth. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen that critique okay. that you have. But uh, when I saw it on the big screen, there were shots where a character would walk across screen and it was very obvious they put it on twos. And I was like, oh, it, it bothered me. Interesting. Because <laughs> okay. I was like, that just jerked across screen. Why are they doing that? And then I saw action sequences in New York where they're jumping around. I'm like, I can't keep up with what's going on. It, it was just <laughs> a little too much is all I'm saying. Now, do I appreciate it? I still do. I mean, it's not broken. We're talking about artistic decisions, which by the way, I love, by the way, that we're talking about it. <laughs> but there's no real rules, you know? I'm working on a film right now and it's a 2D feature film, but we have to make decisions every day. Some of them are budget related. Others are just related to, well, is that gonna look weird? And when you're doing it on the drawing side where you're designing characters and then the layouts and starting to see them in pencil drawings, you still don't know what it's really gonna look like until it's all animated in color. And so there's still guesswork, but I love these movies. I love them. So you're a producer of a, a film coming out called Pencils vs. Pixels, right? Yeah, it's my first live action documentary. I'm really proud of it. So it chronicles the change, this evolution that happened where we went from traditional animation in the 90s to CG animation. Yeah, I mean, I started at Disney, like we said before, on Rescuers Down Under. And really that jump, you could say, started a little bit with Little Mermaid and then Beauty and the Beast. It was just growing and growing. Of course, once Lion King came out, that's when the floodgates opened. It was our first billion dollar film and all the studios wanted to have 2D animation units and creating 2D animated feature films. Literally within a few years, computer animation came along. It started with Toy Story, of mm -hmm. course, being the first CG feature film, and it just did so well. But really, it was Shrek that closed the door. Mm -hmm. Shrek okay. made so much money. They went, oh, they just want CG. This doesn't even look that great. And everybody loves it, and they're pouring money into it. Okay, 2D's gone, go. It's a story that I felt it needed to be told. We made this film and we're very proud of it that it gets that story out from the, not the business people, but from the artists themselves. Now, I know you're a producer on this, but are you in this at all? Are you interviewed? Yeah, I'm in it. There I am. That, I look so bald. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's true. Now, I do have a twin brother, Tony. He's in it also, so it's gonna feel like I'm in there a lot. <laughs> I'm not actually. That's not me. That's, That's not me. That was Tyler. Tyler. <laughs> yeah. He's showing a little too much chest. Um, but we have like legendary animators. We talked about Glenn Keane. We talked about James Baxter in this episode. Floyd Norman, who's a, a veteran that's been around for years. He actually was at the studio when Walt was still alive. You know, Ming-Na Wen is a friend of mine. She's the voice of Mulan, and she came in and did an amazing narration throughout. Wait, is this out yet? Can we see this? As of right now, you can buy it or rent it at Apple TV and all those uh, Amazon, places, Amazon. Hit the link and go get it right now. <laughs> Don't rent it, buy it, because you're gonna wanna watch it multiple <laughs> times, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Boom. Man, I like this school session, but if you're to come back, what can we talk about next time? I don't know, but I'd love to hear in the comments. Everybody, let us know what we should talk about next time. This is great. I, I have, really enjoyed this. I have so much fun every time, Dude, I have guys. Fun with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, every time. All right, I'm gonna go watch the rescuers down under now. And pencils versus pixels. Oh, that one too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Episodes every weekend. Consider subscribing. <laughs>